So I think our goal tonight is to challenge some of the assumptions and to uh, dig down on some of the issues pertaining to the relationship between China and North Korea. That means uh, their historical baggage and the ideological background. It means the military relationship and strategic interests. It means the enigma that is North Korea's economy and how, how China plays into that. Uh, and the question of who actually has leverage over whom, uh, which I'll confess is a, is a hard riddle to, to work out. Uh, but it relates to what we should expect in terms of uh, sanctions and pressure, uh, the possibility that we'll achieve something uh, in terms of negotiations and uh, diplomacy, the prospect of getting there and accomplishing anything uh, through that, uh, and even the risk of military action or some other sort of intervention on the Korean Peninsula. So I won't burn up time supplementing what uh, Tom said by way of a uh, good introduction, other than to say Michael and John are two of the people whose uh, analysis and whose judgment I put the most stock in, and I'm delighted they're <laughs> with us tonight. And I'd like to start with Michael while your voice holds out uh, and ask <laughs> you to, uh, to tell us what you think we need to bear in mind big picture when uh, we think about China's relationship and, and history with North Korea. Great. Thank you, Danny. And thanks to Tom. I'm sorry, <coughs> apologies to begin with. I've got a head cold, and it's kind of slowed me down somewhat. So if I make any errors, just I'll blame the meds. <laughs> um, I'd like to just sort of give you a sense about what I think is China's strategic, if you will, calculus and, how it, and its interests and its policies in looking at the Korean Peninsula and the relationship with the DPRK in particular. As we all know, China's relationship with Korea, with the Korean Peninsula, North and South Korea, has really changed markedly in some really important ways since the end of the Korean War. At that time, of course, China was a staunch ally of North Korea, providing it with critical assistance in a variety of different ways, military, economic, and otherwise an implacable opponent to the United States and, at that time, to the South Korean government. Today, it's, I would say, a qualified supporter of North Korea. Um, and it's, of course, generally cooperative and, <clears throat> and um, has good relations with the South Korean government and, of course, is much more moderate towards the United States than it ever was during the uh, Cold War. Now, despite those changes, however, Beijing's basic interests on the Korean Peninsula have essentially remained um, ever since um, the beginning of its relationship, uh, since the PRC came into power after the Korean War, I should say. And those are three critical interests. One of them is to prevent the resumption of armed conflict on the peninsula for a variety of reasons. The second is to prevent the messy collapse of the DPRK government and regime. And the third is to prevent or discourage the unification of the Korean Peninsula under strong U.S. influence and involving the continued presence of U.S. forces on the peninsula. These three imperatives for China, I think, remain today. They have changed in how China has sought to try to advance these uh, interests but they have nonetheless been there. Now, how have they evolved in terms of policy? Well, since the 80s and 90s, with the end of Maoism and the Maoist regime, the advent of reform and the end of the Cold War and the emergence, uh, ultimately, of North Korea's nuclear, weapon program, nuclear weapons program, Beijing has adopted a more complex kind of a strategy toward the Korean Peninsula. It's, it's tried to defend those three interests that I that I um, mentioned earlier and support its own economic development through four different initiatives. It's encouraged Pyongyang to follow its <coughs> own path in terms of reform. It has provided in the process essential economic assistance continued to, to the North Korean regime. It's also encouraged the North Korean regime to try to uphold international agreements that it has uh, reached with the United States China, uh, it's, and China, of course, and other countries 
uh, to end its nuclear weapons program, and it has sought to draw South Korea closer to itself, to improve its political and economic relationship in particular with South Korea. Now, the Chinese have done the latter in particular because I think the, the Chinese see that the Korean Peninsula eventually, if it's unified, will be unified largely under the aegis of the South Korean government. In other words, the North Korean government is not going to succeed in a unification process. Um, also, I think the Chinese look at South Korea very differently from the way they look at, for example, Japan. They see Japan as more tightly bound in the alliance relationship with the United States. South Korea, although certainly a strong formal ally of the United States, nonetheless the Chinese don't look at South Korea in quite the same way as they look at Japan vis-a-vis -vis the alliance relationship. They've seen more flexibility in South Korea, uh, in part reflecting the South Korean domestic political situation. So China has sought to try to woo South Korea in a variety of different ways. And also, as South Korea's economy has really improved markedly, it wants to benefit from that economy, and at the same time, it wants to exert influence economically over South Korea. Now, these kinds of policies remain in place today from the 80s and 90s, but they've evolved even further in the 2000s um, as North Korea, in fact, has resisted reform. It has resisted opening up in the way that the Chinese have tried to urge it to do for a long time. It has shown a stubborn commitment to developing nuclear weapons and in the process, in some very marked ways, defying Beijing and in certain ways insulting Beijing and insulting the current leadership in China. So what we see is today under Xi Jinping and a more assertive China, Beijing has become far less supportive of North Korea. It's cast doubt on the security alliance that it, that it uh, established, a treaty alliance with North Korea. And Xi Jinping himself has refused to meet with uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, which is quite unprecedented. Um, and also, of course, as I said, they've supported the stringent Security Council resolutions uh, that have been brought over the years against North Korea for its nuclear program. Now, at the same time, Beijing has sought to resist applying what we would call a total embargo on North Korea, or cutting off entirely diplomatic and political ties with North Korea, given the kind of concerns that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, but as the crisis on the nuclear front deepens with North Korea, Chinese interests are incre increasingly driven into a kind of dilemma in dealing with this situation. And there's three that I'll point to. The first is that North Korea's behavior, its continued provocations, presses Beijing all the more to agree to sanctions, but it doesn't want to lead to the collapse of the North Korean regime because it doesn't know what the outcome of that will eventually be. It's not because I think they have close uh, ties to the North Korean regime the way they did in the past, although there are some in the Chinese government who still do think that. But I think largely it's a much more pragmatic calculation as I mentioned earlier. So <clears throat> the pressure that Washington puts on North Korea, uh, on, on the Chinese as well, adds to this. The second is that North Korea's behavior pushes South Korea closer to the United States. As North Korea becomes more threatening, South Korea becomes more receptive to things like ballistic missile defense systems and others that really trouble the Chinese a lot lead the Chinese to put pressure on South Korea, that undermines their objective of trying to improve relations with South Korea and use that as a basis for creating some degree of light between South Korea and the United States. And then third, North Korea's behavior raises the urgency and the importance of China to talk with the United States and South Korea about crisis contingencies on the peninsula about the dangers that are presented by the current nuclear situation, and yet Beijing still resists doing that. So it's caught between understanding the importance of trying to get some kind of understanding with the U.S. and South Korea about how to manage a crisis, but then not wanting to actually engage in official discussions about this because, A, they don't want to signal to the North Koreans that they are anticipating the possible collapse of their regime, B, they don't want to signal to the U.S. and South Korea that 
they might accept certain policies that could lead to the collapse of the regime, and C, they don't want to avoid being inconsistent in calling for peace talks while they're talking with the United States and South Korea about the collapse of the North Korean government or the possible crisis there. So these have produced real dilemmas for the Chinese. And I think they have contributed to what is, in effect, a kind of debate within China about dealing with the North Korean situation today. And on the one side, there are those who think that North Korea has fundamentally betrayed China's trust and fundamentally betrayed China's goodwill in dealing with North Korea. So they want a fundamental shift. They want movement more in the direction of the United States and South Korea. But I would say that that view is still not the majority view. And I'll finish up in a minute. The second thing, the second side are those people who believe that North Korea has, to a great extent, been compelled to adopt the policies that it has because of the insecurity it feels about U.S. pressure against it and the U.S. presence on the peninsula and U.S. forces on the peninsula. And that these things need to be addressed in an important way before North Korea will really uh, try to uh, consider giving up its nuclear weapons. Also, it reflects a certain deep suspicion towards the United States about its ultimate objectives. Does it really want denuclearization or does it want regime change going beyond that in ways that will lead to a unification and US, a larger US presence on the peninsula? This view is still, in my sense, the mainstream in Chinese view. But it is, I think, changing. And you can see it's changing because the Chinese allow public statements now by scholars that are directly critical of Chinese policy in the PRC media, talking about this Korean situation and arguing that the Chinese need to get much tougher in dealing with North Korea. So what could change this situation? There are many different things that could happen, of course, and we're viewing this unfold from a day-to-day -day basis. The United States could decide that there's some kind of kinetic action that is possible that could change the situation in its favor in the U.S., South Korea, Japan's favor. I think that would, if it, it would depend on how it would occur, it would depend on if it seemed to be unprovoked and the United States just decides that it cannot let North Korea even possess the possibility of a nuclear weapon and it will act militarily to stop it, as President Trump has indicated he would do. If that were the case, I think the Chinese would resist the U.S. position because they would see it as pushing towards war. On the other side, if the North Koreans were to do something that was very clearly provocative on their side, beyond what we've seen today, and the, South Korea, and the North Korean foreign minister has even threatened that North Korea could explode a nuclear weapon over the Pacific Ocean. Chinese have told me, and I'm, I'm sure have told others, that if that were to happen, China's calculus would probably change very fundamentally. And China would become much more receptive to taking actions against North Korea that would hopefully avert a war on the peninsula. But the Chinese are in a tough spot in this situation. They're constantly trying to tack between their interests with the United States and South Korea on the one hand and their fears that are being generated by the North Koreans on the other hand. And we haven't by any means seen where this is going to go and I would not predict in, in any sure way where it would go either. Much depends on actions that are outside of China or even outside of the United States. I think North Korea still in some ways remains in the driver's seat in driving this situation. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Michael. That was, that was fantastic. Let's shift gears a little bit, John. And uh, you've done a lot of work on the economic relationship. Um, I very much want to hear about that. And uh, anything that you can add in terms of what the DPRK perspective uh, looks like in terms of the relationship with China. Absolutely. Uh, first off, uh, my thanks to you, Danny, and the Asian Society for having me here today. And uh, great to be here with Michael as well. Uh, the title of, of today's talk, uh, Bitter Allies, uh, North Korea and China, uh, led me to a conclusion. And before jumping to the conclusion, uh, I'll give you a bit of a roadmap incorporating uh, uh, some of the things that uh, Danny requested there and some of the, the highlight points from Michael. Uh, I'm going to end with a conundrum and a contradiction. And to get there, uh, there are three areas that I'm going to cover. The first is a macro picture, uh, 
and that's China's view of history and how they've been traumatized by that history, starting from about the late 1980s until <coughs> there are distinct phases of that. The micro picture, where I'm going to drill in on one of the byproducts of this history, which is the rise of North Korea Incorporated. Uh, that's the regime's web of these elite state trading companies that are doing the business on behalf of the regime, and that has enabled the regime to adapt to sanctions and, and talk about the mechanisms that have enabled it to do so. And then finally conclude with some implications for the core countries involved, the United States, uh, South Korea, and China. So uh, first off, in the macro picture, the uh, North Korean experience of contemporary history is one of a near-death experience. So if you look at it from the 1980s, this is where the Soviet patron starts to contract, and as a result, the North Korean economy starts contracting dramatically. And it was also the time where we see the first big diplomatic approach to dealing with North Korea, and this was South Korea's northern policy. Uh, in the annals of diplomatic history, this is a phenomenal strategy. Uh, North, South Korea at that time was the darling in the international community at the height of uh, what my uh, colleague Joe and I would call the soft power that uh, South Korea was projecting. And with that, they brokered these deals with the Soviet Union and China still during the Cold War. No one knew uh, about the rapid collapse of the Soviet Union at this particular point in time. But the 1980s was this time period where South Korea... Uh, brokered these agreements with Moscow and Beijing where they essentially uh, cut off their relations with North Korea in return for economic trade credits, uh, assistance with their stalled economic uh, reform programs in the case of Gorbachev's uh, glasnost uh, perestroika uh, efforts, in the case of China, uh, Deng Xiaoping's economic reforms. South Korea's ability to extend these economic uh, trade credits and other facilities were enormously important catalysts at that time. So from North Korea's perspective, uh, particularly as it relates to China, this is a period where North Korea views this as the great betrayal, uh, and they sever ties with China. And coincidence correlation, this is a period where North Korea starts doubling down on plutonium. This is where Yongbyon goes into overdrive in terms of cranking out plutonium. Uh, this is a period where, in recognition for this betrayal, uh, this was also the period where uh, North Korea sustains these incredible hardships. The Great Famine is a result uh, largely because of the natural disasters that happened, coupled with the economic contractions that were happening before as well. So you can see how the 1990s uh, for North Korea was that near-death experience. And North Korea, in fact, during that time period was put on a death watch. Everyone was anticipating that North Korea would literally wither on the vine and would be gone by the late 1990s uh, into the latest, the early 2000s. The overall picture, though, I think that comes out uh, is that the Communist Party of China is trying to rebuild relations with North Korea after this period. It was a calculated decision to normalize relations with South Korea. They understood the repercussions. But from a Chinese calculus, there really isn't a standalone North Korea policy or a standalone South Korea policy. It's always framed in the context of a Korean Peninsula strategy or Korean Peninsula policy. And so with this effort to try to have stability on the Korean Peninsula, as the China-South Korea economic and political relationship grew and thrived, and if you think of a pillar, it became a very strong pillar, the view of the China-North Korea relationship was one of a very fragile uh, type of relationship. And if you think of architecture, the, the, the structure started to wobble. And, and you see the concerted effort on the Chinese side to rebuild that relationship. There were opportunities. The greater that North Korea fell into these areas of weakness, the more that the Chinese could contribute. So you see the strategic aid, uh, emergency assistance given to the North Koreans, and essentially a bailing out of the Workers' Party of Korea by uh, the Communist Party of China. Fast forward to the second part of the contemporary history, and this is the Sunshine Policy period. So North Korea uh, essentially stumbles along, eventually gets its bearing, uh, and then we have two back-to-back -back progressive governments in South Korea, uh, and with that, the uh, Sunshine Policy that enables uh, North Korea to more sustainably recover. This was a unique period because if you think of uh, the Chinese approach to, again, the big picture here, trying to build the relationship in this pillar with uh, North Korea. The Sunshine Policy was a model that, from a Chinese government think tank analyst community perspective, uh, was seen as a very viable model. But as we see the Sunshine Policy uh, come to its end with the uh, voting in of a conservative government, the Chinese view was that the notion of the model was right, but the implementer was too fragile in terms of swinging back and forth in the political spectrum. This is where we see the advent of what I call Beijing sunshine policy with Chinese characteristics. Uh, 
This is a calculation by the Communist Party of China to build up the institution of the Workers' Party of Korea so one day they don't have to deal with a member of the Kim family. So it is something of a long-term game plan. And if you see the resourcing of it, there was a critical visit that then Premier Wen Jiabao uh, had in uh, Beijing and in uh, Pyongyang in October 2009. He signed three agreements at that time with Kim Jong-il. Uh, the popular press you know, saw it as vestiges of propaganda. But uh, if you look at it, the first deal, economic development, uh, the second one, education, and the third, tourism, those became gateways. And the messaging from the Chinese side was really to a Chinese audience, saying that under Chinese law, it's legal to do business with North Koreans. Uh, and if you look at those three uh, agreements, they become gateways. So the economic development one, when the Chinese authorities are pushed and pressed, you have to implement sanctions more. Some of these activities, they classify as economic development. Uh, and they look at some of the language in the UN Security Council resolutions, where member states are not prohibited from engaging in economic development and humanitarian activities with North Korea. Tourism is important because Chinese citizens are, are right now the only ones who are able to go to North Korea without a visa. This, this idea of trying to foster tourism gives you a free flow of, of goods and people across the border. The third one, education, is interesting because if you hear of these reports of North Korean workers in China, many of them are on training permits, which are classified as an educational program. So this is done by the book, but this is a part, I think, of a longer term game plan. So let me quickly shift to the, the next part, the micro picture and the rise of North Korea Incorporated. One of the derivatives of this contemporary history is that you see the North Korean regime. They've been doing procuring, they've been doing business all along, but the ways that they're able to do it now through North Korea Incorporated is fundamentally different. And the reason why is North Korea Incorporated has migrated into the Chinese marketplace at the invitation of the Communist Party of China. Now, this was not designed to give them the mechanisms and the outlets to procure banned items for their nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles program. Uh, and if you look at the broader statistics, a vast majority of the trade between China and North Korea is in <coughs> benign goods. But what happens when you build a commercial channel is that as legitimate goods flow through, you can also use it to essentially uh, bring in illicit uh, goods as well. And if you look at the, the circuitry and other things that go into the higher end ballistic missile uh, development uh, phases right now, the smaller the piece, the bigger the bang you get in terms of where the North Koreans are. So this procurement uh, aspect of it uh, is a small percentage of the overall trade, but you, you really have to focus on the mechanism. The other part is this adaptation. Now, clearly sanctions are having an impact in key areas. However, in other areas, if you make the analogy of sanctions as antibiotics, by applying these antibiotics on the North Korean regime, in key instances, the North Korean regime is exhibiting superbug traits. It, there's a certain type of resistance to key types of measures. And that's out of literally the original measures uh, are no longer feasible, and they have to figure out new ways of doing it. By being in the Chinese uh, marketplace, the North Korean regime is then able to use more uh, frequently and in greater scale Chinese private companies that act as middlemen. So in the logic of sanctions, what you're trying to do is vis-a-vis -a, -vis a target, you're trying to elevate transaction costs. So it becomes eventually prohibitively expensive and damaging if you are going to engage in business with that target. But in the case of some of these private Chinese companies that are tied in with crap party officials, local law enforcement, and so forth, their ability to use their network and leverage that is crucial. One of the key areas there that we're seeing some of these unintended negative consequences is as you apply more sanctions in this specific area, these private Chinese companies view that as a business opportunity. Uh, they view the elevated risk, their ability to leverage their network as a way to proposition North Korean clients and say, I can get this item that you want for you, but it's going to cost you more in terms of commission fee and perhaps the item itself also elevated in terms of price. That's a monetization of risk. And in market parlance, that leads to efficient markets. And so we're seeing the North Korean entities doing business in the Chinese marketplace actually getting better because of this monetization of risk phenomena. And that's the first thing. That's a sanctions conundrum. So the conundrum aspect, keep in mind here. The, second, the, the third part of, of the talk I wanted to uh, zero in on are the implications. So what? All of these things have happened, so what? So the three key areas that I wanted to focus on, the United States, the administration right now, has formally uh, labeled their policy, uh, their strategy, maximum pressure and engagement. We don't hear much about the engagement part, but certainly we hear a lot about the maximum pressure. And economic pressure right now uh, is in overdrive. So as we see more and more of the economic pressure, and increasingly going away from targeted sanctions and also introducing measures that 
or wholesale economic embargoes in some instances. Uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, focus on this idea that sanctions don't work until they do. Uh, the problem right now is the North Korean program is so far advanced that their progress is measured in months, whereas some of these measures would take years. So even if these measures do take that full effect, North Korea could have uh, finished that uh, last assembly component and gone to mass production of a nuclear arsenal. So the measure, even with this type of intensity, may be too late. The other part is, as we get to that point much earlier than we anticipate, uh, the concern is that it leads us to this path of focusing more and more on military pressure as the last policy tool. Because if you expend and run through all of the economic pressure options, uh, the military pressure one is really the last policy option standing. Let me shift uh, to South Korea. Uh, just a very direct point. Uh, South Korea has lost its monopoly on sunshine. If you look at China's sunshine policy, its characteristics are unmatchable in the sense that, number one, not even at the height of South Korea's sunshine policy was there one single North Korean state trading company operating in the South Korean marketplace. Yet you see the, Chinese, the North Korean state trading company managers embedded in all the commercial hubs in China, in the Chinese marketplace. That second characteristic is that the uh, fragility from the Chinese perspective, the instability of democracy. You go from polar extreme to polar extreme. You don't have the ability for these type of sunshine policies, even under progressive governments, uh, to reach its full potential. From a Chinese calculus, it would take many, many years, not just uh, one particular term. And the last uh, characteristic from the Chinese formulation of sunshine uh, is really this idea that when you look at it, the institution building of the Workers' Party of Korea, that is a very important objective for the Communist Party of China, uh, something that other countries really can't commit to uh, on the scale that China is. And then finally, the contradiction. If you look at it in terms of a, uh, something of an equation, 2P is greater than 6P. So the two-party approach, the Communist Party of China trying to build up the institution of the Workers' Party of Korea, for the primacy and the, the priority of trying to build up and shore up the stability of the North Korean regime has become literally the front and center game plan for the Communist Party of China. Certainly, for all the points that Michael has mentioned, there is a great deal of tension, great deal of animosity uh, in terms of North Korea taking advantage of some of these opportunities. Uh, but in terms of the broader uh, strategy of trying to boost uh, stability, the two party is still uh, the number one approach to dealing with North Korea. And that has led to a situation where the 2P is greater than the 6P, the six-party talks. The problem, the contradiction is, if you're North Korea, why would you commit to a denuclearization deal if all of the economic and political benefits are being given to you without linkage to denuclearization in the, two, in the 2P? So that's the contradiction that unless we resolve that, uh, the other pressure tactics, we're going to feel this type of insulation. It'll defy laws of gravity but you have to take into impact, into consideration the impact of these broader trend lines as it relates to the legacy and the long shadow of the history. Thank you. Thank you, John. Wow, that's fascinating. And uh, your, uh, your conundrum about uh, sanctions uh, smartening up North Korea, Inc. is just another indication of how those wily capitalists uh, uh, are diabolically clever. We gotta be on the lookout for them. <laughs> Um, but let me ask Mike, Michael, you know, John laid out a case as to the degree to which North Korean uh, senior economic and commercial officials are embedded in China, and that ought to, by rights, translate into leverage that China has over the DPRK, although uh, they, they may have, as you pointed out, strategic interests in avoiding chaos, certainly in avoiding war, and as you said, avoiding unification on, say, American-friendly terms. But what I keep stum stubbing my toe on is why uh, a strong, uh, proud nation like China, a system like the Communist Party under Xi Jinping, sits still for, as you put it, uh, so much embarrassment. and. Uh, and humiliation and insult. There was a series of North Korean provocations, nuclear tests, as well as ballistic missile tests, that were unmistakably timed to coincide with the BRICS summit or the Belt and Road Forum or the uh, summit with Putin or the uh, 
uh, on the eve of Mar-a-Lago, or the greatest, most grievous offense against 1.3 Chinese million, 1.3 billion Chinese people, of course, was to conduct the nuclear uh, test during Lunar New Year's. That that was really <laughs> unforgivable. Right. Uh, and then, oh yeah, they murdered Kim Jong Nam, uh, who was ostensibly under uh, China's protection. They uh, not only purged but murdered Chang Song Tak and uh, quite a few of the uh, China Chinese sympathizers in the DPRK system. Right. How is it possible that China is consistently turning the other cheek and at the same time not applying uh, this the sort of implied leverage that uh, John is describing. Well, I, th I think the Chinese, as I say, they constantly grapple with these dilemmas in dealing with this situation. And they, I think John's right in, in the sense that the Chinese distinguish between the Kim clan and the DPRK as a regime uh, and, the, and the purposes of that regime in, in serving their own, the Chinese, interests. Um, I think they, they I, I, I don't think that most Chinese leaders would shed a tear if the Kim regime, the Kim clan, was destroyed tomorrow. Um, but I think they would get very anxious if that required a collapse of the regime entirely uh, with the very uncertain outcomes that would lead uh, to that. So... To a certain extent, they do have to churku. They do have to eat bitterness in looking at and dealing with the North Korean regime on the short-term basis. But as long as they remain um, concerned about the outcome of a very tumultuous uh, Korean peninsula and the posture that South Korea might take in trying to unify that peninsula and the role of the United States therein, they will continue to be, uh, they will continue to take it to some degree, at least from the larger perspective, while not giving uh, Kim Jong-un, Kim 3.0, any kind of face in terms of the way they deal with him. And, and, they are given, and they've given him no face. Uh, in, in their dealings with him. Right. So, you know, that's, I mean, that's where they are. I mean, I think many Chinese recognize this, yeah. uh, that they're caught in this situation where they can't uh, be very d decisive about any, of these, about any of these things. And they are, to a certain extent, playing the long game, as John suggests. Uh, I mean, one issue for me in, in listening to John's analysis of this is to understand the degree to which the kind of integration of North Korean entities in the Chinese system exists independently of the PRC government and the PRC regime. And, and the degree to which the PRC regime is knowledgeable of and is frustrated by these tentacles, by these integrated sort of elements, or the degree to which it actually looks the other way deliberately and says, okay, well, this is still the parachute for the North Koreans and, you know, we'll, we'll let this kind of stuff go on. Now, in the last couple of rounds of resolutions, it seems to me that the Chinese are becoming less the latter and more the former. But you may disagree about that, John. Well, let's pursue that. Um, John, the... Chinese uh, closed circuit TV and yeah. uh, monitoring system may be slightly underdeveloped in the Northeast, mm. uh, but it's certainly moving towards absolute uh, control. And it looks unlikely that if, as you say, uh, North Korean uh, commercial managers are embedded not just in, uh, in the Shenyang area, but throughout the major cities in China, that uh, the central authorities aren't entirely oblivious to this. You're also describing a very heavy uh, economic and commercial dependency of North Korea on China. Mm -hmm. And that seems to translate into what uh, mo most American officials have long believed, which is that China has a great deal of leverage. They don't have much influence over <coughs> North Korea because they don't use their leverage. 
but they do have leverage. On top of that, you see uh, a, a virtually complete uh, halt to uh, the import by China of North Korean coal and iron, other minerals, uh, a radical diminution of uh, seafood, of garments, as well as of exports of oil, although maybe you can uh, tell us more about the degree to which China is, in fact, uh, implementing, observing the sanctions. So how do you square that circle? Sure. So uh, uh, two immediate responses. One is uh, with respect to the coal uh, trade and the statistics and the oil as well. There are the Chinese uh, government statistics, uh, which many analysts view as heavily politicized. So if there's pressure from Washington, Miraculously, the month before, there was a much larger, as they look at the trade statistics, reduction in the trade. Uh, but the phenomenon that we're seeing is smuggling. And that's the part that uh, you know, the Wall Street Journal yesterday reported, uh, Japanese surveillance planes observing a North Korean uh, freighter uh, taking on uh, some oil. Uh, and so when you look at that kind of coping mechanism, there are uh, efforts ongoing the scale of which is surprising. Smuggling, we knew that was going on, but anecdotally what we heard were uh, small vessels going in, a few barrels of oil being put on uh, these fishing trawlers and back to North Korea. So it was the, the high quantity of these transactions at sea that led to some aspect of stockpiling. The fact that the North Koreans are using large freighters to, the, to do that gives you a sense of this adaptation. Uh, so the <coughs> smuggling component, uh, you know, I think you can see that as leakage. If you are trying to uh, increase the economic pressure. In the marketplace, if you reduce quantity, price goes up. So you're incentivizing risk taking. And you should, it's not to say we should abandon these measures, but if you think of it as turbulence, you have to factor that in and then how you're going to adapt and go about uh, responding to that. The second part I, I wanted to mention is that right now, for the Chinese authorities to implement some of these reductions in the purchase of North Korean coal, uh, it's convenient because the economy on the provincial side, on the Chinese side, is, is depressed right now. So when you look at it, when North Korean coal came online in the second half of the 2000s, uh, the economic development of these three, three Chinese provinces was directly fueled by this coal coming in to fire up the steel plants there. Uh, and that was a very large industry. Uh, internally, you saw the promotion of those provincial party officials to the big times, to the big leagues in Beijing. So you, you saw this uh, connection between these very profitable uh, business operations, really, that leads you down this paper trail of how the heck did the North Koreans start producing coal in those volumes? We knew that they had all that coal, all the way back to the Japanese colonial period, but it, the prognosis was it was too expensive to get it out. So one of the things that uh, the research shows is that you had provincial Chinese state-owned enterprises mining using Chinese public funds to develop North Korean mines, as the North Korean coal came into the Chinese marketplace, this little racket privatized the coal. And you have to remember, in the second half of the 2000s, global commodity price for coal was at historic highs. So those individuals made a lot of money. Uh, and I think the legacy of that gives a sense of how uh, it isn't just the North Koreans benefiting from this type of border area trade. Uh, and also now, because of uh, the decrease of economic activity in China and less need for the product of the steel mills, uh, it's convenient to drastically reduce that coal. Well, the, there is obviously a dramatic reduction. Um, and if North Korea is dependent on uh, the movement of primary resources like coal and uh, gold and iron ore, uh, as well as oil, uh, which, as the Japanese story uh, demonstrates is something that can be monitored and is something that, generally speaking, can be intercepted, uh, then it would stand a reason that the Chinese are able to shut down that in significant quantities. Moreover, my recent experience visiting Dandong in Shenyang area was in talking to local officials, uh, the execution of Jiang Song attack. And in fact, we had a program with uh, uh, Lee Jong-ho, uh, former Office 39 official, economic official of North Korea, who himself said uh, the purge of thousands of uh, 
uh, Jiang Song Tech uh, fellow travelers or subordinates uh, has robbed Chinese uh, businessmen of partners and made it uh, infeasible for uh, Chinese to either do business inside North Korea or generally speaking for North Koreans to do business along the border area. There are a lot of projects that are just frozen uh, because nobody has confidence that they can get. Does everybody know who he's talking about? Jiang Song Tech? Probably they don't. You might want to explain who he who he was. Uh, sure. So uh, he was the uncle of Kim Jong Un uh, through marriage, and he was uh, married to uh, Kim Jong Un's aunt. This was Kim Jong Il's younger sister, Kim Jong Hee, uh, and he he's a very important protagonist in North Korea Incorporated because he's the one who developed the system. Uh, the origins are actually North Korean state trading companies leveraging off of the North Korean resident community in Japan in the 1980s. Uh, so there's a lot around uh, the importance of uh, this individual Danny's mentioning. Uh, and that, that is absolutely true. You know, after he was uh, uh, put on charge, uh, tried and then executed, his network, uh, all the key players were brought to Pyongyang. Uh, they were all you know, vetted to a certain extent. And you saw uh, disruption in business activities for a time. But one of the things that's unique about Chang Song Tech is that he developed these political relationships with senior Communist Party of China officials, and then he monetized those political relationships. So it's very difficult to replace someone like that. Moreover, uh, he has convincingly demonstrated that uh, nobody uh, wants to be a number two uh, in a one-man system. That's right. Well, and not, not to be too close to the Chinese, no. Yes. Well, let's pick up on that point, Michael, because not only was Chang Song Tech and his network uh, exterminated, uh, not only has Kim Jong Un refused to uh, receive senior envoys from right. uh, yeah, Beijing, but, but when he has accepted them, as in the recent visit uh, by Song Tao. Uh, he wouldn't meet them personally. He humiliated them. Right. When I was last time I was in Beijing, uh, my Chinese friends who met, who handle North Korean affairs were griping that Song Tao hadn't even been served a glass of water. <laughs> the ultimate insult in Asia. Uh, so there's a lot uh, uh, th there's a lot of bile in in both directions, but. Let's look at the, the military side of it. Uh, and the Chinese trained uh, senior leadership in the uh, Korean People's Army is sure. no longer with us, uh, as we know. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> you have a lot of experience with uh, the PLA, the Chinese military, uh, current and, and retired. Um, give us a sense. Can you give us a sense of what, uh, under what circumstances they might uh, consider intervening uh, in the Korean Peninsula, if any? Or uh, what kinds of planning and contingencies would you suspect the Chinese themselves are doing? And I guess maybe the $64 million question is, what kind of reaction, other than uh, stern talking to, from the press spokesman's podium, <laughs> what kind of reaction would you expect from the Chinese military if, in fact, uh, the Trump administration uh, chose to take some kind of kinetic action against North Korea? Oh, well, simple questions to answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think the, ch I mean, the Chinese military looks at this problem in ways that are quite similar to what the Chinese party leadership looks at this problem. I mean, they, they see that the dangers of uh, the North Korean regime developing these nuclear weapons. Um, they see it as, a, I think, a danger that, that is uh, destabilizing for, um, for the relationship with the United States and with South Korea. And, and just simply because they, they can't predict and control exactly uh, how this program is evolving. Uh, I think they are very hesitant, despite that, 
to think in terms of military options for intervening in North Korea under any conditions other than um, real chaos, where the continued existence of the North Korean regime is heavily in doubt, and there is the possibility that South Korea, uh, and with it possibly the United States, would move above the 30th parallel. Um, I think the Chinese have certainly developed um, options for intervening in North Korea to establish a buffer, at the very least, along the border, um, and no doubt to identify and try to secure nuclear weapons if the situation there really became chaotic. Um, and, of course, the possibility that they would have to even put larger forces onto the peninsula. Some people argue that the reorganization that the Chinese military has recently undergone, uh, they've undergone a big reform effort. It's also involved the reorganization of the command structure of the Chinese military regionally. Mm -hmm. And they have <clears throat> made changes that arguably make it easier for the Chinese military to intervene along the Korean Peninsula over water, not just mm -hmm. through the land side, mm -hmm. which they would, know, they would not have the capacity to do decades ago, of course. Today, you could argue that they might have that capacity. But I think they're, as I said before, I think they remain very cautious about this situation. They, they <clears throat> I mean, of course, I have no idea what the <laughs> internal uh, actual military planning is that the Chinese are going to under, uh, undertake if, if certain things happen. But every time I've had dialogues with the Chinese and I've had uh, crisis simulations involving the Chinese on an unofficial level, involving the DPRK, involving real disarray uh, on the peninsula, the Chinese, and these include military analysts, they have been very hesitant mm. to signal in any way that China would move quickly across that border in the event of unrest, unless it were in the extreme cases of what I've, what I've mentioned before. I think in terms of military provocation, if you will, I think the Chinese are the most concerned about the United States today. They're not concerned as much about the North Koreans. I think they look at the Trump administration and they don't know where the red lines are. Um, Chinese have asked me, senior Chinese military have said to me, what is the force calculus here? I mean, what is the cost-benefit calculus of trying to use force against North Korea to get them to stop developing nuclear weapons? Because we don't see a good outcome to any of that. from Of course, they would say that. <clears throat> and they say it by way of also asking <clears throat> that the United States in some way, shape, or form let them know before it would actually take a decision to use force against North Korea. Um, they, of course, you know, make all kinds of sort of benign uh, explanations as to why they would want that advance notice. But <clears throat> I doubt they would get it. Um, and, they, and so they worry about that. I think they're, they're most concerned right now with what the force threshold is for the United States, and they ask about that all the time. Thank you. Before we open the floor to questions, let me ask you a, a quick one. Uh, how does the North Korean leadership make money? Hmm. Uh, now, I, if they can't sell... They coal, literally make money. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. That, that, uh, that's a very, very interesting case study. Uh, in the beginning, it was absolutely that, the super notes. The North Koreans uh, were so good at it and sophisticated. And yeah. The operations, it's all in the public domain now, but getting $1 bills, you know, uh, uh, getting rid of the, the imprint and the dye and using the paper, uh, and somehow they perfected the plates and the super notes. They're, they're so good 
uh, that uh, eventually the Treasury Department and the U.S. Mint had to redesign the, the $100 bill. There's also concern that the, the North Koreans are applying that uh, expertise to counterfeiting the RMB, the Chinese currency. So it's a transferable skill set, it looks like. <laughs> uh, so that, that's number one. Number two Jeez, is uh, wow. narcotics. Uh, there, there are large pharmaceutical uh, factory assembly lines in, in uh, North Korea, and so that, that was a big revenue source earlier on. Particularly methamphetamines, right? Absolutely, and that's the part with a dirty little secret now that's uh, <coughs> the public domain is that's made its way into the Chinese provinces as well. So there's a parallel detention center system for those who are trying to leave North Korea. These are the economic migrants as they're labeled by the Chinese authorities and those involved in the drug trade. Uh, the other part of it, earlier on, we saw North Korea very active and uh, very prolific in uh, being an arms dealer. Uh, North Korea has a reputation of making the best knockoff AK-47s and also selling missiles back in the day. Uh, but now, uh, the, the mineral resource trade the amount of money they made in the second half of the 2000s, uh, I think we still see the residual of those funds, in many cases as dedicated funds financing proliferation. So one troubling aspect of that phenomenon is that even the current efforts to block off the North Korean revenue streams now, it may be too late. If they already have those slush funds from that time period and they're drawing on it, it's certainly coming down, but if they're uh, very strategically drawing down on it, that's a troubling uh, capability the North Koreans have. And finally, uh, more and more reports, very difficult to verify, but uh, North Korea engaged in cyber activities. Uh, not the cyber attacks, but cyber theft. Uh, and now reports coming in about hacking into uh, uh, cryptocurrency <coughs> exchanges in South Korea and so forth. So uh, this is not the type of backward, you know, technologically uh, handicapped regime. It's extremely adaptable. And that's the part that, as you look at uh, some of the reports and the evidence, uh, it's shocking to many, but uh, if you follow that, that line of reasoning, uh, you see North Korea as having been a very active member of these type of uh, uh, revenue jetting ventures. Terrific. Well, we've got a lot of uh, great people in the audience. Let me open the floor to questions, and we've got a microphone. Uh, so raise your hand, introduce yourself, and kindly make it a, a question and uh, not a soliloquy. There's a gentleman right in the back, right there. Hi, I'm Homer Williams. I'm retired. Uh, I have a couple, uh, actually a whole list of questions. But first of all, uh, I, I would like a better uh, definition of uh, North Korea, Inc. I feel that uh, that could also be flipped and viewed as Chinese colonization of North Korea economically. Uh, which is uh, not politically, but economically. You see this in Land's End shirts being sewn in North Korea as pictures have come out and so forth and uh, other production. Uh, uh, and uh, the s second, if I can read my handwriting, is... Uh, Yes. Well, that's a big that's a big question right there. So oh, let's please. let's ask John to sure. Uh, so the the direct uh, definition is uh, it's a network of uh, elite North Korean state trading companies uh, that do uh, in separate ways. These aren't the same companies. They're they're task specific uh, core ones that are designed to generate revenue. And so we see the cold trade dominated by uh, subsets of these elite state trading companies, and then another group that are specifically designed to go out and procure. The wish list, almost like uh, an annual wish list that comes from the center. Uh, and to your point, uh, earlier on, that was a big concern in South Korea, that as we heard re uh, reports of Chinese 50-year uh, leases on North Korean mines, that this was economic colonization of North Korea. So South Korea very concerned that this had impacts in terms of their efforts to uh, affect reunification. One thing I, I would add to uh, North Korea Incorporated, though, is uh, when you look at its activities, uh, the key features are, are striking in their normalcy. If you look at the managers who run North Korea Incorporated inside of the Chinese marketplace, you take away North Korea and you could say American expat, Australian expat, British expat. They are just doing business uh, on a globalized uh, basis that uh, in many respects helps them to be even more effective than the previous way of doing business. Uh, yes, the lady in the uh, black jacket here. 
Hi, uh, Elizabeth Shem, UPI. I had a question for Dr. Park regarding, um, well, first of all, I was fascinated by your, um, the, wor the, the concepts you use to describe uh, North Korea's resistance adaptation, superbug resistance, which leads me to believe that it's part of the organism of China and the Chinese economy, which in turn is part of the superstructure of the world economy. So it seems almost impossible to impose the sanctions we want to impose on North Korea and to get them to denuclear. So my question to you is, um, what, what, are the, what is the downside of recognizing North Korea as a nuclear weapon state, given that its uh, program is so advanced? And does it have anything to do with you know, their own aims of you know, splitting the US-South Korea alliance and um, other downsides? Thank you. Uh, sure, a couple of ways to, to address your question. You know, uh, with respect to living with the nuclear North Korea, uh, very strong voices in uh, the U.S. administration right now have an equation. It's Kim Jong-un equals irrational plus undeterrable plus revisionist plus commercial now. What that means is that he's literally crazy, so you can't get into <laughs> some kind of arrangement with him. Uh, and because of the ICBM tests of last year and, and the American homeland now increasingly at risk and held at risk by uh, not a regime, a country, but an individual, uh, that is seen as, as very urgent, and some would say panic. And that leads to the undeterrable part. There are also others within the administration saying, you know, we should calm down. We are deterring and peacefully coexisting with China, Russia, and previously the Soviet Union. But the debate that goes back and forth is that you're deterring countries, groups, and organizations, in the case of China and Russia, but in the case of North Korea, it's a millennial with nuclear ICBMs. And that is frightening to any military or national security professional. <laughs> and no one's able to give a good answer of this evidence that, you know, uh, Kim Jong-un is not suicidal. Uh, then the third part about revisionists is that North Korea, as a full-fledged nuclear weapon state, this doesn't mean peaceful coexistence. Kim Jong-un will be a nuclear bully uh, using conventional means and others to get his way and eventually affect reunification on North Korean terms. And the, the fourth one, commercial, is that once he has a viable weapon system, he'll sell it. And, and the, the message is here, uh, sell it to Iran. And that's the formulation, and not to say the only formulation, but one strong, and I would say, growing view why the United States can't live with the nuclear North Korea. Uh, could, could you explain? Yeah, just, on, because the Chinese are on record repeatedly as declaring that uh, the People's Republic of China can't accept a nuclear North Korea either. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think they genuinely believe that a nuclearized North Korea is not in their interest. Uh, the question is, how do you get there? And w how do you balance that against the, all the other interests that they see in dealing with the Korean Peninsula, which we've been talking about? Um, they, I think the Chinese generally, they think that the North Korean regime, they don't think it's insane. Um, they don't think it is, is just going to haul off and fire an ICBM at the United States. Um, I think that they, however, do have the concerns that a nuclearized North Korea could undertake actions like John has mentioned, which the United States shares, could try to export, uh, could try to intimidate and coerce, um, could use nuclear weapons uh, in ways they could ultimately be used to threaten China itself. Mm -hmm. And they could also be used in a kind of Cargill type way in, the, in, in South Asia, um, giving uh, the sense that North Korea has this backstop, which is you're not going to ultimately destroy us because we have nuclear weapons and we can strike you. Therefore, we will, do, we will be more willing, the risk threshold goes down, and we would be more willing to engage in actions that would be um, highly destabilizing. I think people in China, they're concerned about that. Now, I think to get to what John said and, and Danny, I mean, I've heard some people in, in the Trump administration say, we don't think the North Koreans in any way seriously believe the United States threatens them. Um, the United States, they know the United States doesn't threaten them. They want nuclear weapons to blackmail and to divide the ROK from the United States to gain leverage through that using both using conventional and other means that will then start this unraveling of the alliance in ways that could ultimately give North Korea some kind of an advantage. And in that process, they're willing to take risks. 
um, fairly high risks because they haven't given up the idea of unifying the peninsula largely under their influence. Now, I don't, I don't you know, share that categorical view that the North Koreans don't think the United States is any sort of threat. I think they definitely believe the United States is a threat. The question is how they balance that particular calculation uh, against their desire to use nuclear weapons to unify the, the peninsula. I mean, keep in mind, at one point, the North Koreans were willing to give up their nukes. I think they were genuinely willing to give up their nukes uh, at one point. Um, people can argue against that and say they never had that idea in mind to begin with. They always were committed to developing nukes. But I think you can make a strong counter-argument to that. So there is a kind of calculus at work there. I think we've gone beyond that now. I don't think any North Korean leader now thinks that nuclear, they can give up their nuclear weapons. Uh, I think they believe that, that, that they are just giving them much more leverage than they would otherwise have. Uh, and they're willing to continue to, to use that leverage and to try and develop that leverage. The question is, you know, how far are they going to develop it and how are they going to use it? Let me add one more factor, if I may, which is this, that uh, for North Korea to be uh, accepted as, uh, and legitimized as a nuclear weapons state would, in the view of, I think, most uh, analysts, spell the end of the global non-proliferation regime. Right. And uh, it's hard to imagine a scenario in which uh, the recognition by the United States of uh, North Korea's status as a nuclear state, not merely uh, against our uh, judge better wishes and in the face of crushing sanctions, but to be accepted in, uh, as, a, uh, as a de jure nuclear state. It's hard to imagine a scenario in which that doesn't translate into a push in South Korea uh, to acquire its own nuclear weapons capabilities. It represents a tremendous erosion of American deterrence. And it's equally hard to imagine a, a world in which there was a nuclear North Korea, a nuclear South Korea, but not a nuclear Japan. And there are scenarios that have this superbug spreading to Vietnam and to Taiwan and to other parts of the world. And that's, I mean, we're just talking about Asia. Uh, so it has uh, huge and negative implications for the existing nuclear powers, not limited to the United States. But let's use our time to answer, ask and answer questions. There's a gentleman in the back. Uh, yes. Here's your microphone. Thank you. Um, Thomas from the NYC Political Forum. Um, a quick commentary and a question regarding this <coughs> dear leader being a bully and very irrational. So there's also this doctrine known as Juche, which, as many of you might know, it's this idea of self-reliance, and that's kind of ingrained into this official state-sponsored ideology. So it's um, both you know, economically and also national security self-reliance. So once this regime emerges as a nuclear power and they join the elites, you know, League of Nuclear Nations, will they then back away from some of this rhetoric and now they are self-reliant on their national security, there's some stability. Could you see a scenario where they emerge um, as economic power and go through certain reforms like China did in the 80s? Uh, it sounds like a fever dream to me, but... Uh... <laughs> I mean, it's bound up. There's arguments about, I mean, from, from my point of view, I think that to a great extent the North Korean regime, meaning the Kim regime and the ideology of Juche, uh, is bound up with the idea that it is under siege. Uh, it's under threat. And that justifies an enormous amount for the North Korean regime and an enormous amount of deprivation on the part of the North Korean people. And it's hard for me to see how the North Koreans would make that transition away from that to the kind of approach that you're talking about, particularly given the South Korean 
existence of the South Korean government and the South Korean economy and the South Korean society, which is more dynamic, more open, much stronger than the North Koreans. And they know that as well. So if they open up seriously, as the Chinese have urged them to do for decades, I think they understandably, from their perspective, would see that as a hugely dangerous option. They would rather try and benefit from the kind of nefarious economic dealings of one sort or another that they have with the Chinese and others and, and exist in that, in that world than risk uh, the kinds of outcomes that would come from fully opening up. I don't know if John agrees with that or not. I do, I do. Uh, I, I would just add another element, though, in addition to Chiche, Pyongjin, right? So Pyongjin is, uh, is something that uh, when I first uh, heard it, it was in one of these track three dialogues with North Korean diplomats uh, held in Scandinavian country. And uh, the whole explanation of Pyongjin was scoffed at. Because if you can imagine almost nine years ago to have a North Korean diplomat lay out a vision for independent nuclear deterrent, for self-defense, and then build up the economy in a parallel way, uh, that, that was seen as some sort of delusion. But Pyongjin uh, is very much real in a North Korean sense, and they have the facts to back it up. Last year was unbelievable in terms of the bre breakneck speed of the development of the different testing cycles. Some of them happen in matters of weeks in between. So we had the first ICBM test uh, July 4th, and we had the second July 28th. Uh, and that was the, July is going to go down in the history books as a month where North Korea became a threat over there to one that suddenly held the United States hostage psychologically. And that is a huge game changer because now uh, if you listen to some of the discussions in Washington and the administration, North Korea is ranked higher than the, the war on terrorism. Uh, so it gives you a sense in a short period of time how uh, you've seen the, the upending of that long priority for the United States. But quickly about Pyongjin, why I think it's, uh, it's something that merits further investigation in a serious way. If you think of Pyongjin trying to support the whole country 100%, then certainly there's holes in that logic. But if it's geared to just bolstering the prosperity of the 1%, uh, it's doable. And so the traditional way of analyzing North Korea on per capita basis automatically gets North Korea in the ranking of failed or failing state. But if you divide the coal trade or, or the GDP numbers by 200,000, which happens to be the population of the elites, there is prosperity in Pyongyang. And there's a confidence in Pyongyang that I think from a North Korean perspective, it's, it's not a showcase. This is, this is very much real. The implications of that, though, uh, you know, I've, I've heard from uh, Chinese government think tank uh, colleagues that they're sympathetic to Pyongyang. And they see similarities in it because that's what China did. You know, China did a minimal nuclear deterrent, didn't want to engage in a costly arms race and then plowed in all the other resources into getting the economy going. Uh, and so from that perspective, uh, the stabilization, the bar is getting lower. If North Korea just stays quiet for a long period of time, you don't call it a freeze, but if, if it essentially affects a freeze, I think you'll see interlocutors on the Chinese and, and the Russian side that makes Pyongyang much more viable than people imagine. Let me take one question that uh, came in uh, via Twitter, which is, um, what sort, of bar what sort of leverage, what sort of bargaining uh, chips, Michael, do you think that we have uh, with China as the U.S. to try to uh, get China to uh, take more action to uh, coordinate with us or to advance the, the pressure strategy? You could probably answer that better <laughs> than I can because you've tried many, many times. Well, since I haven't succeeded, <laughs> now is, it's your turn. It's my turn, yeah, right. I mean, I, I, all of these, this issue turns on how much the United States is, A, to what degree does China really decide this issue? To what degree is its influence in this, in this situation decisive? And I think that is... Um, a debatable argument. Now, I, I mean, we could get into a discussion about how how resilient this whole infrastructure is between North Korea and China, and could it be broken down, uh, or is it, given the nature of the PRC system, how it operates, the cronyism, the corruption, and all the rest of it, it's just impossible under the ex existing situation to be able to uh, 
to to break it down. But um, you know, I, I tend to think that the the Chinese influence here is limited. So if if you think it's but, but if you think it, it has decisive influence, and the Trump administration is very unclear about this, it waffles around all over the place about this issue. But it, it does think that um, it, can, it can squeeze the Chinese more, and I think the main tool that it's using to squeeze the Chinese on this more is the possibility of using, con- of using military force. I think that's the biggest difference between the Trump administration and its predecessors is that it's more credibly trying to level the threat that it could actually use force against the North Koreans. And of course, at the same time, the North Koreans themselves are driving this, as I said earlier, because they have gone through this process, as John says, of moving the ball so quickly on the nuclear front. So ultimately, Danny, the answer, I mean, it gets down to what is the United States willing to risk mm-hmm. in its relationship with the Chinese, which is a gigantic relationship across a whole range of different issues, what is it really willing to, to risk? And, and does it get that calculus right as to what the consequences would be of really trying to pressure the Chinese? And would they be that com, com absolutely sure that if it worked, it would affect the North Korea situation in the way they want it to be affected? That's a lot of ifs. Yeah. <clears throat> Back to the forum. Uh, we have Lee Siegel with us. Lee, can I get you a microphone? Uh, Michael Swain said something interesting, which some of us actually believe, which is they had given up their nuclear weapons. And the question that always dogged some of us was why? I mean, you have nuclear weapons. Presumably that's worth something for your security. Um, but I think that raises the deeper question. You guys are focused primarily on the China side of the equation. What about the North Korea side? Let me give you a hypothesis, just a hunch, which is the North Koreans have talked for years about not wanting to be dependent on China. This goes back to the Cold War, where they played off the Soviets against the Chinese. And their solution under Kim Il-sung in 88, was to reach out to the United States, South Korea, and Japan to try fundamentally to alter the relationship. And they began using the nuclear program as a device for that purpose. Okay? Is that still plausible? Is that still something? I mean, they still say these things. Again, just because they say it doesn't make it so, but they still say these things. Is is, does that factor into Chinese thinking about the problem? Because clearly people around the state council understood the North Korean position that way. So i just throw that out. Well, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, the one thing you have to keep in mind is that <laughs> the, Korea, the North Korea of 1988 and the North Korea of today, I think, is very different. Uh, and the Chinese had some degree of confidence in dealing with North Korea back in the 1980s, that they could get a clear answer from them and that the North Koreans would do things that would not really jeopardize their interests. I don't think they have that confidence at all with the, with the current regime. So they're, they're not willing to give it the benefit of the doubt in terms of using its nuclear... I see Danny's argument about, you know, they get their nuclear weapons and then they want to just put them in the in the back and then move along, and the Chinese might think, hey, this is just like what we did. But I think that they look at the North Korean regime today and they just don't see that it has that kind of capacity Mm. to be able to pursue that kind of a policy effectively without... And and they see the United States. The United States is not going to tolerate that for one minute. I think that, I mean, we wouldn't be here talking about this situation if it weren't for the fact that the North Koreans are acquiring a nuclear capability to strike the United States, and the United States believes they might actually use it in a really no-kidding way. And that nobody knows what the United States calculus is in dealing with that problem. And I've asked this of senior U.S. officials. You've got a policy now that's, that's basically, as John 
summarized it, keep the screws going, they'll break. That's the policy. There's nothing else. Keep the screws going, they'll break. And that, my question is, the obvious one, let's say they don't break. Let's say they keep going with their nuclear weapons. Let's say they're not going to freeze them because you don't even want them to freeze them. You don't pressure them to freeze them. Let's say they're going to develop a no-kidding capability where you can look at it and say, these guys have that capacity. Today, I don't think they do, frankly. But that they get to that point. I said, you're going to go to war over that. You're going to go to war over that? I mean, is that... And they can't answer the question because they don't want to signal to you what they're willing to do because they themselves don't know what they're going to do. Trump doesn't know what he's going to do. You might disagree, but I don't, I don't think he knows, ultimately. And I don't think most U.S. officials know what they will do. But the issue is possession versus use. You have to stop them from possessing those weapons, and you will do anything to do that. That raises a whole host of policies and decisions, as opposed to you need to deter the hell out of them. You need to try to contain them. You need to try and limit their ability to use their nuclear weapons in any way, shape, or form, but they're going to be there. You're never going to accept them, but you're going to have to have a strategy for dealing with them. And those are two very different things. And right now, the United States doesn't want to talk about that latter option. They don't want to talk about it because it signals the ability to accommodate. But they're caught because the North Koreans are in the driver's seat. If they, if they decide they want to keep on developing, the United States has to respond in some way, shape, or form. And right now, their only response, as I said, is keep screwing. Keep screwing that down. <laughs> let, me, Lee, let me go back to uh, your I'm question. I'm not a fan of their policy, as you can tell. So. We know. <laughs> let me go back to your question and raise an issue, which is that um, in the late 80s, North Korea, besides denying a nuclear program at times, asserted that it was prepared to relinquish it, that he was pre prepared to abandon it. And uh, I had the experience of engaging and dealing with the North Koreans uh, from then up till 1994 uh, in an, an agreement that may indeed have been a commitment uh, by the North Koreans to uh, abandon its nuclear program. Uh, but we didn't take the North Koreans at their word, and we uh, felt it essential to uh, develop independent ways of confirming that their nuclear program, in fact, was halted. And as it turned out over time, uh, it wasn't. Today, what the North Koreans are saying is we will never denuclearize. We will never relinquish our nuclear uh, deterrent. This is part of the Pyongyang policy. Uh, you Americans have just got to live with it. And today the United States is in, and the world is in the ironic position of not wanting to take North Korea at its word again because we want to try to create a pathway to negotiations and as difficult uh, as it is to envisage a scenario in which North Korea willingly relinquishes uh, its uh, nuclear program, uh, governments are disposed to believe that North Korea could be brought unwillingly to a set of difficult decisions where by relinquishing its program piecemeal, uh, through a gradual rollback, uh, is the least worst option available to it. All this ducks the question. Did you ever think, did you, in your job, and those of you who are watching, ever think that one of the main purposes strategically for North Korea was to reduce its dependence on China by reaching out to us? Dependence for security above all, but secondly, economically. And the question is, if that is still true, that gives you a basis for negotiating, because it gives us leverage, not the Chinese. 
okay? There's a different logic working here. If you start from the China end of it, you get down one road, will they, how much, will they? If you start from the North Korea end, if this is plausible still, it gives you a very different outcome. Uh, the short answer to your question, did we consider, is absolutely. Uh, there's no question, uh, as Michael alluded to, given the history uh, on the Korean Peninsula, there's no question that the North Koreans uh, bridled badly at their vulnerability, their dependence. And Juche is very much uh, a, a strategy for uh, trying to ensure that uh, the past won't be recreated in terms of China's dominance of uh, the DPRK. Uh, so one of the bitter ironies of the Korean situation is that uh, Kim Jong-un's decisions and policies have resulted in a historic level of dependence, political security as well, and particularly economic dependence on China. Uh, another irony is that Kim Jong-un's decisions have created a situation in which uh, China's worst fears, namely a more robust American military presence in Northeast Asia and the stronger U.S. ROK, U.S. Japan uh, alliances that Michael referred to are uh, coming into being in pretty significant and uh, dramatic ways. I think the North Koreans fear this more than they do the Chinese. Yes, I, I think, sure, I think they have a desire to be independent. They don't want the Chinese pushing them around. Um, I think they've pretty well shown that the Chinese are not pushing them around. But I don't think they fear the Chinese are going to invade them. I don't think they necessarily fear the Chinese are going to destroy them. Um, now, we can debate endlessly as to whether or not they really think the United States could do that, but the United States certainly could do that. And Trump has threatened that directly, explicitly. We will eliminate you as a state if you threaten us. And that's pretty, I think that's pretty <laughs> strong. So, you know, yes, they have that concern. No, I don't think it would be enough to justify a policy that would be based on what you're saying. Well, Michael, John, uh, we're out of town, time rather, <laughs> in town, we're out of time. Uh, you've memorably introduced some great concepts to the debate, including the superbug. Uh, so let good, me ask good. the audience if you join me in thanking John and Michael for their discussion.